will begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Amen. Studying the Acts of the Apostles, uh, I'm not going to reread the verses on the top there. Acts 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. That is the theme, really, of the whole book of Acts. Uh, Luke wrote this to follow primarily the disciples Peter and then Paul. Here at Pentecost, it's Peter who preaches the sermon. We're going to start by looking at the promise of Pentecost. So if you've got your pencil and like to fill in lines, the promise of Pentecost really started in the Old Testament. When God created the, the material of the universe, we're told the Spirit of the Lord hovered upon the deep. The Spirit of the Lord was active already at creation. Throughout the Old Testament times, the Spirit of the Lord was active. Think of, well, think of some of the men like uh, uh, the judges. Gideon, the Spirit of the Lord was on Gideon and he went to war against the Philistines. Samson, the Spirit of the Lord was on him. Because he was a Nazarite, Samson was not supposed to have his hair cut. When he had his hair cut off, the Spirit left him. But when his hair grew back and Samson was in prison and fastened to the, the pillar of the temple, he prayed to the Lord in faith and the Holy Spirit came back and strengthened him to tear down the whole temple. So the Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament and related to what Isaiah said in our Isaiah reading today, the Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with these rebellious people. And he said he would remove his spirit from the nation. They were hauled off into captivity. A few of them came back to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple, but nothing like it was. So it is at the time that John the Baptist began his ministry, he said, I baptize with water, but the Holy Spirit, the, the Messiah will come and will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We're going to look at these Bible verses that are listed for you. And I'm going to have you only look up the ones in John. I think it would take a lot of time paging back and forth. So I will read these passages. First of all, the one from Matthew chapter 3. This is John the Baptist. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. Because that's the Messiah, the promised Messiah. So the promise is for the Messiah, but look at the promise for the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist is already predicting the Holy Spirit uh, coming. And the Messiah will send the Holy Spirit. And this is what we have at the very top of the page. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Before Jesus ascended up into heaven, he said, you wait. Turns out to be ten days. You wait until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that I will send you. And he will strengthen you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So the Holy Spirit is coming. Now, I'd like to explain a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Some people think that God is one and only one person. There's a lot of uh, controversy on God being one God and three persons. So you've got a lot of religions in the world that claim to be Christian that deny the threefold nature of the Trinity. 
Well, we know obviously that the Father is a person. He's called a Father. He created the world. He worked. He preserves. He does. He talks. That's personal. What Jesus, from the time he was a little baby, they say no crying he makes, but I think Jesus cried as a little baby. No, they just didn't get it on camera or, or on, on the recorder. Why did they write no crying? You know, remember that's a Christmas, away in a manger, no crying he makes or something. I think Jesus was a total, real human being, a person. So you got two persons. Now you got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon Samson and strengthened him. He had to be a real being, not just spiritual ghost, some kind of a, a wind. See, the Greek word for spirit is the same word as wind, pneuma. You know what a pneumatic drill is? Did you know a pneumatic drill starts with a P? Pneumatic. I, the dictionary doesn't let you say that. But the Holy Spirit is a person. So whenever you hear God working, it's either the Father, or it's the Son, or it's the Holy Spirit. So God is one God, but we know Him as three persons. Let's look at the prophecy from Luke chapter 3. John, John the Baptist, answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, whose thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is... Now that's the same as Matthew. Luke has it almost word for word like Matthew. Okay, John, you're, anybody in John? John 7... 38 and 39. This is where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. And the disciples were amazed that Jesus would talk to a Samaritan? Well, sure, the Holy Spirit is there for everyone. The Holy Spirit wasn't just a spirit for Israel. The Holy Spirit has the good news for the whole world. Whoever believes in me, Jesus says, as the scripture said, has streams of living water flowing from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now I need to do a little interpreting there. Does that mean the Holy Spirit wasn't around? Was the Holy Spirit not there when, when, when Jesus called his disciples? Well, sure the Holy Spirit was there. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit coming with power and fire in a form of judgment and in a form of salvation. That wasn't going to happen until Pentecost. So here when we read, up till this point the Holy Spirit had not been given, his disciples didn't know they were supposed to preach to Samaritans. Well, they, what was Jesus doing talking to a Samaritan? And then Jesus actually shared the gospel with the people of Samaria. The Holy Spirit worked through the word, but the powerful uh, giving of the Spirit wasn't there. That's what we're going to talk about today. That's what Pentecost is all about. The powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit's here right now? Jesus. Cross, Jesus. Noah. The Holy Spirit gave power to Moses. Okay, the Holy Spirit's here. The Holy Spirit's here, right? The Holy Spirit's there in your heart. You couldn't believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior if the power of the Holy Spirit hadn't taught you. Let's look at some of the descriptions of the Holy Spirit. I will ask if someone could read from John 14. Has anybody looked up ahead, looked ahead to John 14? 
You know, maybe to keep it on the recording, I'll, I'll go ahead and read this. John 14, 15, and 17. And you might all want to look up this. John 14, we're going to have a couple verses here. John 14, you're going to look at home, at home, look at this. John 14, 15, and following. If you love me, you will obey what I command. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. A counselor is an advisor, a, a director, a teacher. So that's a counselor. Now, this counselor is going to be personal. This counselor is going to be a person. It's going to come. The spirit of truth. So there's a description of your counselor, your informer, your instructor. The world cannot accept him. See, the world resists the Holy Spirit. And we call it the sin against the Holy Ghost. The resisting of the Holy Spirit is unbelief. And the world doesn't want Jesus. The world rejects the work of the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus is telling his disciples and his other followers the Holy Spirit is in you. Now that doesn't sound like a person. I can't get in you. I get my words in you. My words have to come through here. And you know that's the way the Holy Spirit works? The Holy Spirit works in the Word. And the Word comes through that audio canal and it puts some kind of messages in your brain. And then your brain kind of infects your, your heart. Affects. Did I say infect? Oh. Not infect. Affects your heart. <coughs> And, and, and your heart begins to believe this message that the Spirit is giving you. And now there is the Spirit taking up His residence in your heart. And because the Spirit's in there, we say that Jesus is in your heart. It's the work of the Spirit. You're still in John 14? John 14, 26. But the Counselor, it's the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. See the work of the Spirit? He's a teacher. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit when they wrote the Old Testament scriptures. That's what Peter writes. So you have the Holy Spirit talking to you when you read, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the Spirit of the Lord hovered above. See, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. You didn't see him, but if I shared gospel with you today, the Holy Spirit was here. If you actually believe that if you die, you're going to be better off, the Holy Spirit taught you that. John 15, move into the next chapter. John 15, 26 and 27. When the counselor comes, oh, who's the counselor? He doesn't have to tell you again. He already told you the counselor is the Holy Spirit. Whom I will send you. Oops, he just said the Father will send you. And that's why we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son both together sent the Holy Spirit. He will testify about me. You also must testify. If you were looking for a job description of the Holy Spirit, what is it? Okay, he's going to teach. And the content of his teaching... Jesus. I tell a story pretty early in my ministry in Fort Worth, Texas. Actually, it was actually in Bedford. And it was on a Saturday morning that I went door to door. And 
when I told this lady that I was from the Lutheran church, she said, oh, you Lutherans don't have the Holy Spirit. She was Pentecostal. Oh, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't speak in tongues. You don't have the Holy Spirit. You, you don't get all excited. And I said, we have the Holy Spirit. I said, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? Took a little while, but she came up with to testify about Jesus. I said, we talk about Jesus all the time. My sermons are about Jesus all the time. The Holy Spirit is there doing it. I said, we've got the Holy Spirit, or we wouldn't even be a Christian church. Uh, she never came to church, by the way. She went to her Pentecostal church. John 16, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Teacher, now you can read Joel 2 by just turning the page over. Because the back of your study sheet has the quotation of the sermon text. And I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> because I don't have the study sheet. Uh, let, me, let me borrow one. Let, let, me just, let me just borrow yours just for a minute. And this is so that I got the words of Peter's sermon text on Pentecost. We'll get to how he preached the sermon and where he preached the sermon and when Pentecost was. We'll get there in a few minutes. But let's just look at the fulfillment of this promise of the Spirit. And afterward, this is Joel. When the Old Testament talks about the last days and afterwards and in the future, it's talking about the whole New Testament times. The times of Jesus and the time of the spread of the word. Afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. See, that's about all old men can do is dream. Can't do much other than that. But what are their dreams? The teachings of the Holy Spirit. Your young men will see visions. And usually, the young men just look at practical stuff. Young men don't trust visions or dreams. But the young men, Peter, James, and John, and all those other disciples, they had the vision of heaven, what it's going to be like. Even on my servants, both men and women, my servants are believers, any and every believer, any and every member of the church, any and every true Israelite. You didn't know you were an Israelite, did you? You were a seed of Abraham. Anyone who believes, for anyone who believes, Abraham is their father, the father of believers. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. Now that's a, really a picture of the last days when Jesus comes back again. But it happened on Pentecost. We'll see that when we read in Acts chapter 2. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That did not happen on Pentecost. But that's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Because we won't need the sun anymore. And if you don't have a sun, you don't have a moon. You know, the moon doesn't have any light, right? There's no batteries on the moon. Okay. It's only a mirror reflecting the sun. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And actually, verse 32 is the theme of his sermon. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, the word call in the Old Testament is the word put it out. And most people think to call on the Lord is prayer. No, we're calling out the name of the Lord. And the word call also fits for preaching the word. So whoever preaches the word and hears the word and prays will be saved. Now, prayer doesn't have to be fold your hands and kneel and whatever. 
Every time you think about God, as a, be with me. Jesus, help me press on. That's your prayer. Prayer is an expression of faith. Prayer is the Christian's breath. There's a hymn about that. There's a prayer is the prayer is the something about the breath of a Christian. All right. Let's all look at Acts chapter one, verse five, because we are now going to start the actual text of Pentecost. Verse five. John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's ten days later. Let me ask you the question number two. What do you notice about these prophecies about the special coming of the Holy Spirit? Spirit will come sometime. Christ will send the Spirit. The Spirit will be a teacher. The Spirit will empower preaching. But the Spirit will be working on Pentecost and at the end of time. So you need to catch this, that Old Testament prophecies very often have an immediate fulfillment in Jesus coming once and in the second coming at the end of time. Old Testament prophecies are very much pointing to the future twice. Now when Jesus points to the future, he's preaching to your tomorrow, on the day you die. He's pointing forward to the day they put body, us ashes into the columbarium in about an hour. You know, I visited Steve Fisher twice before he died. It's been almost a year, I think, since Steve Fisher died. And all this time they've been waiting for a double inurnment. Did you know that word? Inurnment. Inurnment is when they put the urn into the columbarium. It's not an urn. It's a little box. It looks like it's made out of copper. I'm going to fit in a little box like that someday. And I'm going to be inurned at Grace Lutheran Glendale. Which is better by far than teaching catechism or teaching Bible class or preaching. Oh, but for your sake, it's better that I'm still standing, still talking. Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay. Okay, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost, anybody know what Pentecost actually means? Pente, Pente, cost. Ten times five, fifty. There was an Old Testament Pentecost. If we were to look up Leviticus, and we're not going to do that right now, Leviticus refers to this as the Pentecost or Feast of the First Fruits. Pentecost. Fifty days after what? You've got to count fifty days, you've got to have a starting point. Passover. Passover. It's actually 49 days from the day of his resurrection. But the Sabbath of, Pente uh, Sabbath of Passover was Saturday. So we've got 50 days. Which is kind of a special name for the Israelites. Because if you take the holy number 7 and multiply it by 7, you've got... 49, and you're right up there for the day. Now, Leviticus also refers to it as the Feast of Weeks. If you got why it'd be called the Feast of Weeks, you've got seven sevens. Seven is a week. So you've got a week of weeks. 
Well, the Hebrew thinks that you and you don't use that kind of math. Maybe that's modern math. No, that's old math. That's ancient math. Seven weeks, 49, gets us right up to the big Sabbath of the festival of ingathering or harvest. This was their Thanksgiving day. This was the time of the, of the first harvest coming in. And the Lord said, you bring me the first fruits. So the first crop that a farmer had of his wheat or even the firstborn of a lamb was to be offered to the Lord. And the first fruits was their harvest, and that sacrifice of the first fruits was a burnt offering. You didn't you, you could eat the lamb, the priest could eat the lamb, Levites could eat the lamb, but the first fruits of the wheat and the corn and the plums and the pears, uh, they were burned on the altar. How does the New Testament Pentecost fit on the Feast of First Fruits? You've got to do a little bit of thinking here, because I haven't, I haven't touched on this yet. How does the Old Testament celebration of bringing in the sheaves Fit the New Testament Pentecost. Bring in the new believers. How many sheaves did they bring in? 3,000 3, sheaves. So bringing in the sheaves, I've, you've heard the song, I will come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. And then this, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. You know, Lutheran songs don't do that. Bringing in the sheaves, I will come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. I can't think of any that repeat like that, do they? Maybe, hallelujah, hallelujah. There's a good Christian hymn. In fact, we got several of those in our Easter hymns that repeats, hallelujah. And I think the Holy Spirit always on Easter gives us extra power. Don't you just feel that on Easter? The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. And the Holy Spirit is leading us in our worship. And then you get to October and November and you're just kind of dragging until Christmas leads you up again. Well, maybe you put an answer in there. I'm going to let you figure out a word as we go on. And I'm going to read with some comments. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Well, we're trying to figure out what one place. When Jesus came to Jerusalem, he often stayed at Bethany with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Holy Week, he stayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. They camped out overnight. And when they celebrated the Passover meal, Jesus said, you follow this man carrying water, and he'll lead you to an upper room. And this upper room is big enough for a banquet. And the banquet of the Lord's Supper was celebrated in that upper room. I think that home was very likely the headquarters that Jesus then used. The disciples were locked in an upper room. Most likely the same house, big house, probably owned by a wealthy man like Nicodemus or Zac uh, Joseph of Arimathea. I almost said Zechariah. I don't know if Zechariah had a big house or not. They're all together, and who's there? Let's look back a little bit to verse number 13. When, uh, chapter 1, chapter 1, 13. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. I think it's the same upper room where Jesus had the Lord's Supper. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip, you count them and there's 11. And then along with some women. Oh, there's got to be at least 12 women. 
And in those days, the group there numbered 120. Now, where are they? 120, 132, 144. They won't all fit in the upper room. Can you get 144 in here? What is, what's your capacity? Yes, you can. We can. What is the capacity? It's over 144? Okay. Okay, so this group is gathered. And the problem is there's only 143 believers. They needed to add another believer. And they chose Matthias. Or maybe that's not quite accurate. Maybe there were 144 believers... And out of those, they chose Matthias to be a, an apostle. So there's 12 leaders. And here it comes, the day of Pentecost. There's suddenly a sound like a rushing wind. And, and don't picture the women's hair blowing all over and their dresses and skirts going in dust and leaves. It's the sound of a mighty rushing wind came from heaven. It wasn't, wasn't coming up from the desert, the Sahara, de I mean the, the Sonoran Desert, dry and dusty. It's a heavenly wind. It's the Holy Spirit, right? Sign of the Holy Spirit. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw divided tongues that were resting on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages since the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak fluently. Now, if you were all gathered here in church and all of a sudden you could all speak Spanish and Japanese and Korean, you'd get out there and find some Koreans, right? So here's the disciples on a big festival where people have come to Jerusalem from all over the Roman world, all over the Mediterranean world. They've come from as far away as South Africa. They've come from as far away as India. They're coming in from Parthia, probably with some from Gaul, which is France. And the disciples said, we can't just sit here and talk to each other in Spanish. We can't just sit here and, 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 and gibber in Hebrew and Greek and and Aramaic, let's get out there and share the good news. And the Holy Spirit empowers them. I think the biggest power was in here. Jesus said, go into all the world. And you know what they've been saying for 10 days? We can't do that. You go be a missionary to Japan. No, you can't do that. However, if you were trained and the Holy Spirit filled you with motivation and you were younger, you'd probably go to Japan. Or not. <laughs> or not. Maybe not. I had a call to Japan. I didn't go. I stayed in Texas. Now there were godly Judean men most of, your, most of your books are going to say probably Jewish or Jews. You have believing Jews. Is that what you have in verse number 5? I believe that word Jew should be reserved till the Middle Ages. Or at least until after the New Testament era. These are Judeans. Jesus and his disciples were Judeans. I don't like to call Jesus a Jew. Jew has the flavor of the Second World War. Jew is the flavor of, of Zionism. The Jews that were hated throughout the Middle Ages. Shylock, even Shakespeare wrote books about the Jews. They didn't like the Jews. So this shouldn't say Jew, it should say Judean. I haven't found a Bible yet that stays there. However, I saw two that used the word Judean later on. They heard the sound. Now a crowd is coming. And you know what I think really brought the crowd hurrying? 
They're talking our language. Here they are from Rome and they're talking Latin. And here are these people from Athens, they're talking Greek. People from all these different languages, they gather. They gather. What an opportunity. They were completely baffled and said to one another. In fact, there's a question here. What happened? I mentioned that. They all gathered together. There was a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Tongues of fire separated. They're filled with the Spirit. Tongues were languages. They spoke without ever having learned them in school. Because the Spirit enabled them. I think there's one more miracle. Oh! I gave you the word you're supposed to figure out. The miracle, and I put a plural there, the miracles of Pentecost. And he's got them listed. See them? There's one missing. What was the greatest miracle of Pentecost? Conversion. The conversion of 3,000. Conversion is still a miracle. Every time we baptize a baby, it's a miracle. The Holy Spirit takes over the heart of that child whose sins are washed away. What a miracle in baptism. You get to say miracle in the Lord's Supper because all you, all you do is taste bread and wine. But it's a miracle. You're receiving the body and blood of your Lord. The Holy Spirit is here at work. The beautiful continue. Oh, we're Pentecostal too, lady. We're Pentecostal. We preach the Spirit. I'm not labeled a Pentecostal. I'd rather be labeled an evangelical. But you realize how many groups have, have uh, stolen the word evangelical today? I just found out from the computer on the internet, the largest Christian church in America is the Roman Catholic Church. The second largest is the Baptist Church, if you put Northern and Southern Baptists together. The third largest are the evangelicals. Lutherans are down to about six or seven, down there with the Presbyterians and, and Anglicans. They have developed in our day, ever, ever since Amy Semple McPherson started the Pentecostal movement in Los Angeles. And Pentecostal church is growing. The Assembly of God. The Pentecostal Church, the Seventh-day Adventists, these are all now evangelical. They're growing faster than the Lutheran Church. So the miracle of conversion is still going on. Who was present when the Holy Spirit was outpoured? Do you have it written in from the East? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, are they written in your study here? No. You just have the dots? Well, you don't have to put in all of these. Let's start with from the east. And you've got labeled Parthians, Medians, Elamites, Mesopotamians. Okay. The second one is here at home, Judea, Jerusalem. The third one would be from the north, Cappadocia, Asia Minor, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Philadelphia, okay, from the west. That's the, your one, how many do you have? Your five? One, two, three. You got five dots? Are you filling in five dots? Anybody got, do you have five dots there? Let me see that. Who was present? What happened? Oh, we're back here. Let's see. I don't. Hmm. My study guide isn't very much like yours. Okay, let me, uh, let me just finish this if you are taking notes so that you realize they're coming from the West. Egypt, Rome, Crete. There might be believers coming from as far away as Spain and France. And from the south, Egypt, 
Arabia. Uh, can't think of the name right now. What's the other name for uh, uh, the Coptic? Coptics. Coptics. Cap Say it again. Ethiopia. Yeah, Ethiopia. Okay. So I'm done with all those people. When they were amazed and perplexed, when they kept saying to one another, what does this, hey, that's where Luther got that. What does this mean? <laughs> Luther's always quoting the Bible in his catechism. He go, what does this mean? Others mocked and said they're full of new wine. They're drunk. Ah, there's Peter's opening. Hey, they're not drunk. Peter stood up with eleven, raised his voice and spoke loudly and said, Men of Judea, you don't have Jews there, do you? Any of your translations have Jews? Listen to me. Men of Judea. This is verse 14. Fellow Jews. Fellow, you say fellow Jews? Oh, no. Men of Judea and all of you residents of Jerusalem, Understand and listen closely. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Have you ever been not drunk by nine o'clock in the morning? Now, nine o'clock at night, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> Understand this and listen closely. These men are not drunk. It's only the third hour of the day. On the contrary, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And you have that all written out for you. I will call it his sermon text. Do we still follow the same practice? We read that before. So I'm going to ask you at sermon, at question number two. The sermon's message. What is the theme? Look carefully at that text from Joel. What is the theme of Peter's sermon? Press on. No, no, that was mine. Okay. Well, you said earlier, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, and that's assuming if you call on the Lord and you pray and you proclaim his name, that's faith. So everyone who believes and in faith calls on the name of the Lord and shares Jesus with the neighbor, he'll be saved. And so I'm not going to go into the sermon except going on to verse 22. I've got men of Israel. What do you have at starting verse 22? Men of Israel. Is that men of Israel? Doesn't it say fellow Jews? Good for them. Good for those translators. They got it right. God has, let's see, He's going to support the text from Psalm 16 that says that uh, Jesus wasn't going to stay in the grave. He's going to be resurrected. And then he quotes from uh, Psalm 101 that uh, the stone that was rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's Christ. So there's quotations from other Old Testament Bible verses. Now, in my sermon today, I preached from a text called Philippians chapter 3. What other books of the Bible did I quote? You should never stick with just one book of the Bible. You preach the analogy of faith. We preach the same thing whether we preach from Genesis or Revelation. I quoted Romans. How many chapters in Philippians did I quote? Four. All four, okay. <laughs> And you're going to read all four chapters at home this week, right? I told you that in the sermon. Pastor said it. you got to do it. I think. Isn't that right? The pastor says it. Aren't you supposed to do it? There. It's law. It's law. <laughs> oh, oh, no. I offer you the words of the gospel. Please read Philippians. Please. Yeah, privilege. Okay. You know what? Pastor said we were not going to get through all this material. And I said, ah, oh, come on, there's not that much here. 
This will take till 3 o'clock. I want to do one more thing, and then I'm going to quit. I am going to preach you a Pentecostal sermon, and I will see if you will repent and be baptized. Sound familiar? Okay, here we go. Men of Israel, you people of Chino Valley and some of you coming from Prescott, you Arizonans, <laughs> you Yankees, most of you are from up north anyway. Any of you born in Arizona? Anybody here born in Arizona? Well, from all the world, people come and hear the good news. So I want this for all of you, people of the world. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commended to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs. Don't you realize what Jesus was? He changed water into wine. He made the lame walk. He was able to heal the blind and the deaf. Don't you realize that Jesus was somebody very special? Don't call Jesus just a great man or a wonderful teacher or a fine example. No, God accredited him as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. But you know what you guys did? You didn't believe in Jesus. You got so upset with Jesus telling you you were sinners, you crucified him. He came to be your Lord and your Savior, and you piled all your sins upon him, and you crucified him. You killed the Son of Glory. But this was God's plan, and it was God in foreknowledge to have you kill a sinless man and nail him to a cross. You are responsible for Jesus' death. You are the sinners who didn't walk in the laws of the Lord. That pounds you down to realize what you are like. But he's the one that God raised up from the dead. He freed him from the pain of death. He delivered him out of the grave. He rose again on the third day. Death could not hold its grip. That's what David said in the Old Testament. David said, he will not abandon his life to the grave. Gentlemen, ladies, brothers, sisters, I can speak confidently to you about the patriarch David. He's still buried over there in, in Bethlehem. But Jesus isn't. Jesus rose again. I saw the living Savior. I want to tell you Jesus is alive even today. And Jesus comes to you through the power of the Holy Spirit in this very word. And Jesus is telling you that he is your Lord and Savior. Now, I know you acted in ignorance. In your sins, you didn't fully understand what it means to be a Christian. But now you're a Christian. Now you know better. So repent and return and have your sins wiped out. That the days of refreshing may come. You ought to know if I preach in a sermon very often that this sermon should be refreshing. We keep talking about refreshments over there. The refreshment is in here. The refreshment is the good news. Jesus rose again. And he is your Lord and your Savior. He must receive heaven until the, he must really remain in heaven until the times of everything are restored and he will come back again. He will come back and take you to be with him in heaven. All the prophets from Samuel on tell you that Abraham is your father. You are all children of Israel. You are all believers like Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You believe in God and that's your only righteousness. You don't have any righteousness by what you've done. You haven't cut commandments and said, Lord, Lord, look how righteous I am. Your righteousness and the righteousness that brings you into this church today is your faith. Faith in the righteousness of Jesus. So, at this point on, ah, turn too far. You know what? I just told you something from chapter 4. Never mind. 
Here's the resurrection. Now, the Lord said to my Lord, and this is the interesting thing about it, the Lord God Jehovah said to his servant, you are Lord. Jesus is called Lord. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know this, God made Jesus, whom you crucified, both your Lord and your Savior. And now every one of you should ask a question. What's the question coming? They asked it. I just preached the same sermon. <gasps> what must we do to be saved? And you all memorize this in catechism class. Repent and be baptized. Now, repent has two sides to it. When I mark blue and pink, repent is both blue and pink. Because repent is recognize your sins and confess them. And change and turn to Jesus for forgiveness. Repentance is both sides. Contrition is sorrow. Repentance is a change from sorrow to hope and faith and believing in Jesus. Repent and be baptized and you will receive the Holy Spirit. How many of you are baptized? You have already received the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to you through His Word and sacrament and strengthens you over and over again. And right now I can tell you, you have joined 3,000 Well, there are almost 400,000 in our synod. Christianity is still the largest religion in the world. Wow. From 12 to 120 to 3,000. Chapter 5, it's 5,000. And then they stop counting. You understand why Pentecost is called the birthday of the church? I don't like to call it that because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were members of the church years ago. So this was only the expansion, the miraculous expansion of the church when the Holy Spirit was poured out on these believers. Many things happened. We're going to let pastor go on with, uh, let's see, where are we? Sport attack here. The, okay, can you figure out that verse, chapter 2, verse 37, what you're supposed to put in for the blank on Pentecost? I'm going to tell pastor to start there. Yeah. The blank on Pentecost, not of Pentecost, the blank on Pentecost. You see it? Would you all mark October 6th? What's the first of October? First Sunday in October. Anyway, you know that. When you come back next week, you start Pastor Henning right here at the blank on Pentecost, chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. And then, oh, he can stretch that out. He'd have no problem talking for an hour. I just did. <laughs> May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and our fellowship in and through and by the Holy Spirit continue forever now and in heaven. Amen.